Glad to have y'all here today. <clears throat> equally, and equally glad the heat's working. <laughs> what will we do without any football this afternoon? <laughs> and, uh, Pardon? All right. Order. Here's the deal. We will have a trustee board meeting February 20th. Okay, so that's a week from next week. So we'll have a trustee board meeting in two weeks. No Sunday school today, okay? So we'll resume Sunday school next week. And we've got our table in the back for the food pantry. You know, we support the Montdale uh, Methodist Church food pantry and we'll gather uh, box goods, canned goods, uh, stuff that would make for, you know, uh, that kind of ready-made food and we'll gather it up and bring it up at the end of the month which will not be the end of this month because it will be an extension for sure so that's that <coughs> Stephen White that is Jan and uh, Joyce's cousin making some progress he's off the ventilator that's good he's home he's home wow you know they took 60 like 60 pounds of fluid off of him and 60 blood clots were taken out of a filter so you know it's a good deal that he's home Noah White his son is still in the hospital with complications Josephine Snyder's having health issues John Rippin you know that's Helen Michelle's son he has what is called a slipped rib syndrome and I'm not even sure what it is, we're praying for it, but it's called a slip rib. <coughs> and we need to keep the Corrigan family in prayer again. Um, and Howard Young having a rough time. Uh, Church of the Week, Swiss Town Park, that's, uh, that's in Pittsburgh. Dennis Hanley, their pastor. Uh, Agnes Galk is the senior of the week. And Brian, I think of the um, He's a missionary on a reservation out in Saskatchewan. And so he's the missionary of the week. Of course, the young people, pillars of civilization. <clears throat> Dave, there's a trustee meeting February 20th. Okay? So that's a week from next Sunday. Anybody else ought to be added to our prayer list here this morning? Beth? I'm going to say I praise the Lord for answering the prayer that Sue's there. Mm -hmm. Say yes. that aloud. <laughs> I said, I praise the Lord that for answering the prayer that Sue is here. She looks very good. Yes. 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 Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your cards and for your prayers. That's what does it. God is good. Mm -hmm. God is good. Very good. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, glad you're all here today. Great to have Sue back. We appreciate it, Sue. Uh, Happy birthday, Rev. Huh? Happy birthday. Hey, thank you very much. 62 years old. <laughs> no, 62 years young. <laughs> That's right. I'm not a kid anymore. 
Right, Beth? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, you can't be young forever, but you can always be immature. <laughs> All right, let's turn our handles to 541. Let's off, that's enough to over there, Joyce. That's enough. Standing as we sing. I come to the garden.
They're like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of righteousness, but the way of the wicked will perish. Thank you. May be seated. Let's bow our heads to have a word of prayer. Father, what a great thing it is back together again here this morning in your house with your people. And it's awfully cold outside, but it's nice and warm and comfortable in here. And our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful. We gather together and you come and make yourself known to us in a special way, week after week. We know you're with us always, day in, day out. You dwell in our hearts by faith. But it's a great thing to gather together, two or three in your name, and actually hear the voice of God resonate in our hearts, and see in the faces of the people around us a similar experience. There's nothing like it. So thank you for calling us together. We're so grateful Sue is back with us, and our Heavenly Father, you have blessed us so richly and deeply with people who really make this church so much better than just a skeleton or some, you know, uh, but just a Bible study. Uh, but uh, we're so grateful for bringing Sue and Paul to us so long ago, for their faithfulness and diligence and so much behind the scenes activity that uh, nobody really realizes what takes place all the time. So we thank you for them, for their commitment, and we just consider ourselves blessed that Susan Hendrickson's our organist. We pray today, Father, for all the names on our prayer list, for their men, women, and children here who have great needs, and they require a variety of things from everything from this slipped rib, something we never even heard of, to COVID and various sicknesses of pneumonia and blood clots and all these various issues. Our Father, put your hand upon each and every one. We have a friend, Lord, who you know has a uh, heart situation, and we just pray that she might get a great result. She'll mm -hmm. see the doc and uh, really get this thing taken care of, and we just hope it can be done minimally, and so we put our friends and family together on the altar and ask you to please minister to each and every one. Lord, we think this morning we're friends out in Swiss Elm Park. Dennis and Krista had been so good and so faithful for so long. Now, we have enjoyed their friendship and their ministry, and we just ask your blessing upon that. Swiss Elm Park Church, that you continue to watch over them, use them for your glory. We pray for Agnes Galka. We pray that you put your hand upon her and give her comfort and peace. We pray that she might feel physically relaxed. We know how difficult it is in old age, uh, sometimes We get a taste of it once in a while, we get sick. Sometimes our old folks, they slip into a situation where every day is one of discomfort and it's just a matter of how much. So our Heavenly Father, we pray for Agnes, we pray for all our seniors. We ask you to watch over each and every one. Put your hand upon them and help them. We pray today for Brian Fink and his work out in uh, Western Canada with the Cree Indian Reservation. We ask you to bless the entrench and continue to use them for your glory. Men, women, and children might find good news and life in Jesus Christ. We pray for the young people of our society. Again, Lord, we're grateful that you never leave us nor forsake us. And we look at the circumstances and situations. We look at the changing, you know, times. And uh, we get caught up in the political things and we get caught up in cultural things. But underneath it all, there is always a remnant who will love you and serve you and be faithful to you and find life, powerful life eternal in you. So our Father, we pray that you call our young people, call them to a life that's worth living. Fill their hearts with your peace and make them to know the glory of God. Pillars of civilization, law enforcement agents, United States Armed Forces, public representatives, all those who seek to do works, good works. We ask you for each and every one. We pray for our health care workers. 
We are so grateful for what they do daily, and we've become so aware of it in the recent years and months. We ask your blessing on each and every one. Father, would you please watch over us and hear all our prayers? We gather our voices together and say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For I am the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Sue, would you select a hymn? Would I select a hymn? About 382. 382, that sounds like a good one. <laughs> Let's see what it is. Hey, we can do that one. Okay. <laughs>
And of course, Jesus was tempted to leave his mission, <coughs> take the shortcut to the throne. Our temptations are usually more have to do with something inside us, something that would carry us away. And so we talked about that. And this morning we have Jesus standing up in his own home synagogue. And he announces that this is the time of his ministry and he's fulfilling scripture. Let's see here. See, John, uh, excuse me, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. And I will read with verse 14 and following. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. You know, that's a characteristic of Luke that is uh, very, very important and shows through and through. He does things in the power of the Spirit, okay? The Spirit of God is guiding him as he does these things, and Luke wants us to know that that same Spirit of God dwells in our heart. We become children of God. We're baptized by one Spirit into one body. Okay? That's what being born again really is. The Spirit of God coming into our life. And so, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And the news, or the, uh, the Greeks say there, the, uh, the fame, his fame was spreading all through the whole countryside. And he was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. So Jesus went up to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners. Recovery of the sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him. And they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? And as Jesus said to them, Surely you'll quote me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. And you'll tell me, do here in your hometown what we've heard you've been doing all over Capernaum. Well, truly I tell you this, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you, there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. The sky was shut for three and a half years. There was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not to sent to any of those widows of Israel, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. There were many instead, or excuse me, there were many in Israel with leprosy. In the time of Elisha the prophet, not one of them was cleansed, only naming the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue, you know, the ones that were just marveling at his words, just amazed at his speech, praising God for the things he's saying, looking at him and saying, where did this man get these great words? This is Joseph's son. Well, now all the people in the synagogue, the Bible says, were furious when they heard this. They got up. They drove him out of the town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through that crowd. He went on his way. Let's discuss this. Father, thank you so much for this day and the blessings of it and for the privilege of opening your word. Because, <clears throat> Lord, we're regular people down here. We try to go by wisdom, logic, understanding. 
but the component of feeling, the components of familiarity, what we're used to, so often make it very hard to see past the familiar. Our Heavenly Father, would you pour out your spirit upon us and speak to us? Would you help us to understand that if we don't open our hearts to you, if we don't receive from you not just the gift of the Spirit, but the guidance of the Spirit of God, and let him take us places where we've never been before, and find out experiences that we might fear, but once we get into them, find them perhaps the greatest things that ever happened to us in this world. Would you please speak to us about these things? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a passage of scripture. Jesus is being talked about. He's going all over the area speaking. He's like the, you know, young kid comes out of seminary or comes out of college, full of enthusiasm, natural ability to communicate, you know, uh, loves the scriptures and has a sharp mind and everybody's impressed and everybody says, gee, I wish he'd be our pastor. I wish we could have that kind of exposition week after week and really understand the things of God and Jesus is going all over preaching. Everybody wants to hear him. And then he comes back to his hometown and they're amazed. And they're so proud that he's one of theirs because he's Joseph's son. He grew up in our neighborhood. We know who he is. We're all part of his great success. And Jesus stood up and read the scriptures. And then he started to tell them how that the people that they had been raised to hate most in this world had always been on God's love list. Those Syrians up the road, they've been our deadly enemies ever since antiquity, since as far back as we remember. We've been fighting border wars with them. They've taken our people hostage. We've taken their people hot. That sound a little familiar? The nation of Israel, Hamas. And one day, Benjamin Netanyahu stood in the studio. It was the beginning of the Gulf War. And they were talking about how, <clears throat> why don't you just give the West Bank up to the Palestinians? You know, as a generous deed of goodwill. He said, you don't understand what the situation is. He said, consider this studio we're in. This is the Middle East, okay? All the area, the floor of this studio is the Middle East. Where I'm standing, the actual land under my feet, that's the size of Israel. Everybody around us, they don't like us. Many of them have in their very constitution, the destruction of Israel is a part of what we're all about. And they fund organizations like Hamas to fire missiles over the mountains, down into our neighborhoods. We, you've heard of the Iron Dome, right? The system that catches Every year, thousands of missiles out of the air before they get down to Israel and hit their buses, hit their schools, hit their neighborhoods, wherever. And Netanyahu said, what you want us to do is make it so they're not shooting missiles up over the mountain. They're sitting up on top of the mountain throwing spitballs down on us at that simple. Ladies and gentlemen, we just read the same thing in the Bible. It's always been the same way in the Middle East. Tremendous contention. Why in the world would you imagine that a nation like Israel, so small, really, by world standards, yet seems to be so important? That they were at the heart of World War II and the causes of it. And all through history, the Jews have been a target of persecution. And in the middle of that, they who know that they're God's chosen people, look around them and see these people persecuting them. And <clears throat> what we do, we look at groups of people, okay? 
It doesn't say, you know, Tony the Syrian. It's not an individual. It's a nation of people. And we look at nations of people and groups of people and we, we know who they are before the thing even starts, right? But we have prejudices and we have ideas. Uh, we were raised, my house, we had a concrete you know, up in Oligo, New York. The house was built, I don't know, probably in the late 50s. And down in the basement, there was a concrete walled room, the bomb shelter. And that's real, literally what it was. Our whole neighborhood, those houses were all built at the same time, and they built them with bomb shelters, because remember, the Russians were getting ready to bomb us at any minute. The bombs were all set, and we had our president and our important people, they walked around, remember, with the button. Like there was a briefcase, almost like Don Adams in Agent 99, hopefully not like that, but <laughs> anyways, it got smart. But there was a briefcase, and in that briefcase was the button. And once Russia hit the button and started their missiles here, we were going to open that briefcase and hit that button and start our missiles over there. And the peace stick people, they said, we're going to destroy the whole world. Nobody's going to win this battle. They called it the Cold War, remember? And even to this day, Russia is an heir, and there are enemies. And those people are somehow bad. They're out to get us. We heard the priest up at the hill. At Christmas time, we went to the various churches, and uh, the Orthodox Church up there, and he was telling us, what a deeply Christian nation Russia was until around World War I, when the government changed and totalitarianism, communism really took a hard control and the churches were forced into the background. We all have these prejudices. We all have things inside us. And Jesus stood up in a synagogue in the middle of his hometown he said, you know those Syrians up the road who are scriptures, talk about the wars we fought with them? Do you know there was an awful lot of widows down here in Israel? And God didn't send the prophet to any of them. He sent them up to the Syrians. And then he looked at them and he said, how about... All those lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And you know what the Jews, these people in the synagogue's response was? We're God's chosen people. When Messiah comes, he's coming here for us. And he's sending all those to hell. Everyone who doesn't agree with us. That's what this is really supposed to be about. They were enraged that he should stand up and say, do you think God doesn't love the Russians any more or less than he loves us? We just got through booing China, right? Moments ago. I did. Yeah, that's right. I, as a nation, I boo too. But do you think there's not some little Chinese kid. There's not some Chinese dad. There's not millions of Chinese kids and Chinese dads and little daughters who are just living their life like we are. They don't have any more control of what's going on in Beijing than we have what's going on in Washington, which we just realized so recently and so painfully. God is interested in us as individuals. If God is the God of the German Primitive Methodist Church, and we're the chosen ones, we're going to heaven. And anybody outside the perimeter of these walls, they're on awful shaky ground. If that's all this is, he's not really the God of the Bible. He's not really the God of heaven and earth. He's not really the God of all creation. He's the God that we have installed in our hearts, designed to appear after our own image. 
The truth of the matter is, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know that as a theological proposition, but we have a real hard time of it as a personal. We like personal salvation, but personal guilt for sin. We have a hard time really applying it to ourselves. We exempt ourselves. Like I say in golf, they have mulligans. You hit a bad shot off the tee, it goes off to the side. Oh, take a mulligan on that one. <clears throat> Give me a free shot. Don't count that one. We do it all the time. It's a part of the sinful nature that we have inherited. We are all born in sin. We are all lost until we come to Christ. He is the only hope. We are not as righteous and good as we think. You know, there's a couple scriptures that are important about this kind of a prejudice. One of them is in Luke chapter 17. I want to read the parable because we need to get it really straight. Understand exactly what is said and not just off the top of my mind. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. But woe, anyone, woe to anyone through whom they come. We will live in a world of sin. You can't avoid it. And there will be difficulty and hardship, and as we said last night, right? If you sit around and wait for the perfect world, if you sit around and wait for the right conditions to do the right thing, you'll sit around and wait forever. And you'll never act. We need to accept the world as it is and I honestly accept who we are as we are. There will be evil, but woe to those people who bring that evil. It would be better for them, <coughs> excuse me, to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little children to stumble. So watch yourselves, Jesus said. If your brother or sister sins against you, you rebuke him. And if they repent, Forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. Remember what Jesus said one day on the Sermon on the Mount? And we pray this every single Sunday, don't we? Forgive them our, their trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We pray it every single Sunday. When these people came to Jesus and said, Jesus, how many times a day should we sin to forgive somebody? I'm figuring I'll go seven. And I guess Peter thought he was really climbing the ladder of holiness. And Jesus said, seven. Why don't you try seven times 70? And immediately the calculator went into action. 490 times? Glad he didn't say 491. 490 times. What was he saying? He said, you have to have a spirit of forgiveness in you. That's what Christianity really is. The God who has forgiven you. The God who has received you. The God who has accepted you. The God who could right now, you know, we got that big screen TV back in the back of the church, right? We use it for Christmas time. And at any time we could take that big screen TV and set it up here. And God take control of it. And he could look at any one of us. And broadcast to this room our sins. Now none of us thinks we're that bad, right? But I guarantee you, the things done in secret, the things that are done when you're not when nobody else is around. The things that you would do if you could, but you can't get away with. If they were broadcast in public, we'd be filled with shame and embarrassment. And we would see ourselves in a light that we don't often see because we compare ourselves against the best. What am I saying here? I'm saying we are saved by grace, or we are not saved by, at all. We are the children of God because He is merciful. He doesn't owe us anything. 
We have not earned anything. We have not been so faithful to this church that decisions should be based on my will more so than anybody else. None of us stands in that place. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to that servant when he comes into the field, in from the field, gee, you spent the day out plowing and uh, you spent the day taking after the sheep. Good work. You're almost home. Now we're having dinner here and you as a servant, you know your responsibilities to serve and then take away after we're done and take care of the dishes. That's your responsibility. That's what you say, isn't it? You don't say to them, ah, oh, gee, come on over here and sit down and eat. No. In this culture, they said, no, you prepare my supper, Jesus says. You get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. And after that, you can eat and drink. Will he thank that servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, listen to this, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Those are the words of Jesus. And his parables are meant to be jarring. They're meant to shake you up. They're meant to get your attention. Okay? He doesn't owe heaven to any of us. Not a one of us has lived such a righteous life that we're on the way in and of our good deeds. Those of you who were raised in this church, singing hymns downstairs, coming to vacation Bible school, memorizing Bible verses, it's all good. It all has its place. But none of it are in salvation. We have a relationship with God sheerly and utterly because He loves us. That's the relationship we have. I have a relationship with my father. And with my father, the relationship was not, Alan, you'll be my son as long as the garbage gets out on time. And then you take those trash cans in and when your mother gets home, she's going to have to go up that grade. That snow had better be shoveled. And if it's not, and if she can't make it into the garage, that's your fault, and you're no longer my son. And Alan, how many times have I told you about the report cards? You could do so much, but you're not making any effort. Alan, you're done. You're no longer my son. Those words were never spoken in our house. Okay? The words were, Alan, we love you. You're capable of so much more. And you could do so much better. Alan, if you put your nose to the grindstone, you'll find the greatest things in life. Alan, in the, out of my mother's lips, we will always love you, no matter what you do. You know what? There's a situation I've been thinking about. And uh, let's just say your father gets sick. Any one of you. Your father's still here. Gets to old age. Gets real sick. He can't take care of himself. He could barely make it to the bathroom much less go through his daily activities. He really needs help. He really needs somebody to step up. And you know, he's not really bad enough to be in the nursing home. We don't want to send anybody to the nursing home if we have to. And so he really needs our help. But we have a life to live. We have jobs. We have responsibilities already. And to take on something like that, uh, I don't know if we can do that. Well, you know what? Here's what happens. Somebody 
hopefully in that family, one of the children says, you know what? This is my hour. This is my time. Not my brother, not my sister, not the aunts, not the uncles. Me. I will take this on and work it out. I gotta go to work. I can't quit. That's a fact. But there's things we can do and an effort can be made to see that this is taken care of. When you decide that, when you stop saying, well, you know what, I don't have time, my job is important, I've got responsibilities, when you step up and take on the uncomfortable, you know what happens? All of a sudden you find out you have just plopped yourself right into the most rewarding, enlightening, valuable things you will ever do in your life. When little children come into your life, you don't think all in terms of, gee, I read that it's going to cost a half million dollars to raise this kid. Uh, gee, uh, you mean he needs diapers again? Uh, gee, he's hungry again? Gee, he wet the bed again? Oh no, they're throwing up in the middle of the night. I mean, it's 2.30 in the morning. You <laughs> get busy, right? You just do it. You just take it up. And in the midst of that, you end up doing the most valuable thing you'll do in your whole life. We think we're slaying dragons in the office. We think this ministry is, you know, the most important thing in the world, and so often we're just Don Quixote attacking windmills. And we've got it all backwards. Jesus Christ said, you know what? You become a servant. You'll find out what life's all about. You become a servant. And you'll find joy and peace that you will never, ever know. How do you think Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, King of kings and Lord of lords? When the call came to heaven, these people need a savior and they don't have a chance. They are every last one of them lost balls and high weeds. They're the stone that's fallen to the bottom of the ocean. They're lost in their sin and they can't do anything about it. And Jesus Christ sitting on his throne could so easily have said, hey, I've got a universe to keep in order. And these people made their own bed, they're just gonna have to lie in it. Because I got a universe to take care of. Instead, he stood up, took off his divine robe, and put on the flesh of a human being so that nails in his hands could cut, dig, tear, gouge, smash, and bring pain. So that as a little boy, a little boy, he would know the things that go through the human body when you get a virus, when you get sick. He took on the form we do, tested in every way, yet without sin. All this for what? Because the love he has for you and me is so great that he will overlook all our sin, so I will take care of that myself. And in doing so, the Bible tells us he's given a name above every name, and the greatest seat there is in all the universe. When you've done everything you were called to do, we've only done what was expected. But you know what? The Bible's full of all the aspects of life. And one day, Jesus was talking to his apostles, and of course, Peter. Gotta love Peter, because he asked the questions we want asked. And he stands up and asks it in front of everybody. And Jesus had talked about this to this man. He was a rich young ruler. He came to Jesus and said, you know, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you've got to keep the commandments. And the kid said, oh, I've kept them all since my childhood. And Jesus said, oh, good. Then go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you'll have a place in my Father's kingdom. And the Bible says the guy went away sad. 
And then Peter steps up. And Peter says this. What did he say? Let me see if I can find out what Peter said. One of the other Gospels tells us of Peter. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished. And they said, who then could be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God it, all things are possible. And Peter said, you know what, Jesus? We've left everything to follow you. What will there be for us? Now that's a pretty good question, right? You'd like to ask Jesus, but you don't want to be the one to ask. That's why we love Peter. Jesus, we've left everything. We followed you. Are we, what are our rewards? What did Jesus say to him? Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Bartholomew, Thomas, all of you, you got a place in my kingdom. And you're going to sit and rule and reign with me. You know what the book of Revelation says? That every last one of us who's in Christ will rule and reign with him forever. You don't ever sacrifice anything on God's altar that you don't get back in spades. You don't give anything to the kingdom of God. You don't give anything in secret to others that you won't be blessed far above your wildest dreams. Judging the 12 tribes of Israel and everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake, they're going to receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But don't commit your life to counting up your rewards. Don't sit back and decide, wait till I get what I got coming after all I've done. Because many who are first are going to be last, and the last are going to be first. <coughs> See, everything we do is conditioned by why we do it. What's in your heart? Okay? And that's where the judge of all things is going to look down. And as Oliver B. Green used to say, some of those birds that think they're going to be sitting in the front seat in heaven, are going to be so far back in the back, you're going to need a telescope to find them if they're there. And some of those people in the far back row, like Joan Christian back here. Does Joan Christian go around bragging about her faith? I never heard her. Joan Christian's just a regular person who lives her faith in a godly and beautiful way. Right? And some people from that back row Nobody notices. I've been in up sitting in the front row. They got hearts of gold, and they serve God faithfully, and there are rewards. Let him do the rewarding. Let's just be a faithful servant. Use our time wisely. And we'll help each other. Father, thank you for your holy word. <coughs> because again, we're we have a hard time getting past self down here. We have prejudices that we think, uh, you know, we're, we're in the right church with the right theology and we've made the right commitments and said the right things and therefore we're the chosen people of God and everybody <coughs> who's not from the same house, they're on really slippery slopes. But the truth is, every man, woman, and child on this planet is in the same terms with God. The offer of salvation is available. Whosoever will can take it. Those who receive the Spirit of God and live in that Spirit and serve their neighbor as best they can, don't take care of their own responsibilities, of course. But when called upon by the Spirit of God, step up. Those people have rewards that are incalculable here and forever. 
Heavenly Father, would you speak to us about these things? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, folks. Let us turn in our hymnals to 407. and that we are servants as well. You'll take care of all the things that we're worried about. All we need to do is show up for duty. And our Heavenly Father, would you speak to us about the great love that you have for us? That because you love every man, woman, and child on the planet Earth, we are included. If it's only certain special ones, what kind of assurance could we ever have? But the good news is that Jesus Christ died in the cross for whosoever will. That if anybody should confess their sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Whosoever we are. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 